Hello, I'm Heather Lomas and I'm the Accreditation Advisor for Museum Development East Midlands. I'm here today to uh, talk you through the Museum Accreditation Eligibility and to explain a little bit more about the Museum Accreditation Standard. So let's get started with some background about what the Museum Accreditation Scheme actually is. So it's a scheme that's run for museums and galleries of all sizes and types in the UK. It's a scheme that sets out nationally agreed standards and these are there to inspire the confidence of the public and funding and governing bodies. We have a UK partnership approach to the scheme, so it's managed by the UK partnership and that's between Arts Council England, the Welsh Government, Museum Gallery Scotland and Northern Ireland Museums Council and the aims are for all museums to be sustainable focused and trusted organisations which offer their visitors a great experience. You can download a copy of the accreditation standard from the Arts Council England website or from the Collections Trust website. What is the Museum Accreditation Scheme for then? Well, it's there to encourage all museums and galleries to meet an agreed standard. So in how they're run, how they manage their collections, how they engage with their users and from that to build people's confidence in how museums manage collections in trust for society and how they manage public resources. It's there to reinforce a shared ethical way of doing things for everyone involved in running a museum. And moving on to that, I think it's also useful to think about what you think the characteristics of a good museum are. So if I'm running this session as an accreditation advisor with people who are thinking about becoming accredited, I often ask them what they think the characteristics of a good museum are. These are some of the answers that I've had from some of the sessions I've run. I think as a museum users, we know what we think makes a good museum. And that's a really good starting point for people who are coming new to the accreditation scheme. So you might want to think about what you think the characteristics of a good museum are for you. So how did the accreditation scheme start? Well, it was started way back in 1988 and it was formally called the Museum Registration Scheme. Since then, it has supported museums across the UK to focus on standards. In 2004, the scheme was renamed accreditation to better reflect its purpose. And then more recently, in November 2018, the accreditation standard was reviewed and a new version replaced the previous standard. So throughout the whole of its history, the accreditation standard has been developed through widespread consultation throughout the museum sector and again throughout the UK and with key partners. So it is very much a standard that is embedded within the sector and agreed and approved by everybody who works within it. So let's think about who is accredited. Accreditation covers all types and sizes of museums and galleries and there are currently more than 1700 museums participating in the scheme across the UK. It's a voluntary scheme and it accredits museum sites, so not collections or museum services on their own, but actual physical sites. 52% of museums are accredited, accredited are independent museums and 28% are run by local authorities. So we have a whole range of different types of museums within the scheme. It works for museums of all sizes, so from the smallest volunteer-run museum to the largest national museum. But within that, it's not a one-size-fits-all scheme and applications are assessed according to a museum's size and type. And we'll be coming on to that a little bit later. So why does it matter? Well, um, it matters because it shows that a museum is being properly managed and governed. So for museums to met the standard, that shows that they are doing it correctly. It lets people know that anything they donate to a collection will be accessible to the public and it will be looked after ethically. 
it shows a museum looks after its collections properly and that you're safeguarding them for the future. And it helps museums understand what their users and visitors want and to help them make plans for the future. So it really does matter that museums are meeting this standard. So what are the benefits then? So when you're an accredited museum, what are you actually showing people? You're actually demonstrating that your museum is properly managed and governed. You're demonstrating that you follow professional standards, which makes it easier to get funding and helps give confidence to lenders and donors. You are also demonstrating that you're looking after the collections and you're managing them appropriately. The museum is there and meeting the needs of your visitors and users and that your team is working to an industry-wide standard. It also shows that if you need it, you have access to professional advice and support, and that's through an accreditation mentor. So if you need one of those, then um, your accreditation advisor will be able to support you in trying to find somebody. And I'll come on a little bit more about mentoring a little bit later. It also demonstrates that the museum is committed to staying on track for the future with formalization of plans, policies and procedures. And it's committed to developing and improving services. So what can accreditation do? Well, it can boost your museum's reputation so it can help you win funding. It gives confidence to donors and other supporters. It helps museums to manage their collections fairly, ethically and legally. It provides clear guidance and can support for continued development. And it uses a set of minimum requirements that museums have to meet, which support accountability and performance management and progress. It helps museums work more effectively with visitors and audiences. And it shows that your museum is now ready for new opportunities and partnerships. So moving on now to the accreditation standard itself. So we've covered a bit of the context and why it's important, but the accreditation standard um, 2018 is uh, organised in three key sections. So the first one is organisational health. The second one is managing collections and the third section is users and their experiences. And within each of these sections, we have key areas that the standard covers. So those key areas are organized into nine sections. So we have our three areas, organizational health, managing collections, users and their experiences, and a total of nine areas, three in each of those areas. So organizational health covers museums having the appropriate governance and management. It covers museums planning ahead. So number two is planning ahead, making sure you have an appropriate forward or business plan and the resources to deliver it. Section three is about assessing and managing risk to your organization, including in that section things about security and emergency planning. Under managing collections, it encourages uh, museums to develop policies, plans and procedures as appropriate. So that will be related to collections development, so holding and developing collections in section four. In section five, holding useful and usable information on collections, so thinking about how you document your collections and make the information accessible. And section six is caring for and conserving collections, so ensuring that you have the necessary policies, plans and procedures in place to manage and care for objects. In the third area, users and their experiences, we have at number seven, museums being accessible to the public. So ensuring that you have all that's needed for accessibility across the board. Um, section eight is understanding and developing your audiences. So knowing who your current audience is and who your new and developing audiences might be and helping you to do that. And section nine is how you engage with your users and visitors and improving their experience. 
So those are the nine areas that the standard covers. And I'm sure when you look at that, you'll think, yes, those are the good things to be. If you're a good museum, those are the areas that the museum should be covering. So it's covering all of the bases for a museum. So how, what is there to support the standard? Well, the guidance document supports the accreditation standard and that's available on the Arts Council website and on the Collections Trust website. And it provides museums with all the detailed information and practical support that you'll need to complete the application form. It includes museum indicators. So if you remember, I mentioned earlier about the size and scale of museums, it enables museums to think about where they fit within the indicators and decide on their size and scale. It makes it clear how expectations differ for the type and size of your museum. The guidance document also includes key assessment questions so you can see what the assessor is looking for. That means there are no surprises for anybody when they submit an application. The clarity is there, you can see instantly what you're supposed to be doing. There is additional support available. There's information and documents on the Collections Trust website. There is support available through your museum development team and through your accreditation advisor. And you'll often find that other museums who are also in the accreditation scheme are very willing to talk to you and share some of their documents and information with you too. So how do museums become accredited? Museums wishing to participate in the accreditation scheme are initially assessed for their eligibility and they complete the eligibility questionnaire and we'll be coming to that in a minute. Once confirmed as eligible, you will have three years with working towards accreditation status during which time you need to submit your full application. You don't have to wait to the end of the three year period, you can submit at any point. But during this time, museums are eligible for support and grants from museum development. So it's a good opportunity to do some development activity to enable you to meet the accreditation standard. Accredited museums are then invited to submit a return every five years. This confirms that the museum continues to meet the standard in all areas. The accreditation guidance document provides all the information to support your application. So it provides information at the beginning to support your eligibility questionnaire completion, but right through until your actual submission. So it provides a whole range of information all in one incredibly useful document. So, is your organisation eligible for the accreditation scheme? So to apply for the scheme for the first time, or to, if you're reapplying after a period of non-participation, there's some key things that the organisation must meet. So you have to be based in the UK, the Isle of Man or the Channel Islands, and you have to meet the Museums Association 1998 definition of a museum. And I'll come on to that on the next slide so that you can see what that says. The museum has to be a physical site, space or building which is regularly open to the public. So it has to be somewhere that somebody could come and visit. Um, as you know, so it's not just uh, an online presence, it has to be a physical site. It must enable people to see and engage with the museum collections. And the organisation has to have an appropriate constitution which supports the long term purpose of a public museum. And that has to be embedded in the governance documents that support your organisation. So the, the mu museum is embedded in there that the organisation has the powers to run a museum. Organisations also have to commit to make a full application for accreditation within three years. So, so there is a space on the eligibility form for an organisation to make that commitment and attach any relevant information to support that. Once you've submitted your eligibility questionnaire, Arts Council England will let you know within six weeks if your museum is eligible to join the accreditation scheme. 
So just referring back to, to that other point about the definition of a museum, this is the 1998 Museums Association definition. So museums enable people to explore collections for inspiration, learning and enjoyment. They are institutions that collect, safeguard and make accessible artefacts and specimens which they hold in trust for society. So there's some key things in there. And when you're thinking about how your organisation meets that definition, um, there's some key things there to be thinking about. So just moving on from that, we mentioned earlier about the appropriate constitution, just to flesh that out a little bit more. The museum must be a long term organisation that exists to benefit the public and protect its assets, including collections. And the accreditation standard um, has five constitutional requirements for a museum's governing body. So those are listed there. You have to exist for public benefit. You have to be able to demonstrate that collections and assets are appropriately protected. The organisation has to have the powers to operate a museum and hold collections and assets. And these powers have to be transparent and they should not include the ability to distribute assets or profits for private gain. Uh, the governing body it, it has to be subject to statutory regulation or judicial process in relation to its conduct and it must be a permanent entity with a long-term purpose. <coughs> Excuse me. Arts Council provide a range of supportive information about museum constitutional requirements and including a really useful uh, flowchart checklist as well as more detailed information within the overall guidance. So the quick reference guide mentioned there is the flowchart that if you're unsure is a very good place to start. So I've mentioned the questionnaire. I thought it would be useful if we could just run through it just so that you're familiar with it before you might complete it. The eligibility questionnaire is available um, to download and to complete from the um, Arts Council England website or from Collections Trust. I would advise though that you, it would be useful initially to have a chat with your museum development provider team and particularly your accreditation advisor just so that you could chat through the requirements before you complete the form. This is what it looks like. It's got a num not very many pages, it's quite short but it does have some key information that it asks you for. So on it, page two, it's asking you for your contact information so that we can contact you. Um, and uh, so that's general information about who's making the uh, application and the contact information, quite straightforward. On page three, there are three questions. So it's asking you where the museum is based. And then question two asks you to uh, discuss the how the museum meets the definition of the of the museum that we discussed a couple of slides ago. So it's asking you in 300 words or less to actually talk about how your museum meets the Museums Association definition of a museum. So that's a nice opportunity to be able to think about what you actually do and how it relates to that. Question three asks you about where the museum is located and whether it's regularly open to the public and it asks you to describe the museum's opening arrangements. Again you only have 300 words maximum to describe that. Question four is asking you can the public see and engage with the museum collections and again you have 300 words to be able to describe what you're doing to enable people to engage and see the museum collections. Question five asks you about the constitution of your organisation. So it's asking you for the name of the governing body. Sometimes the name of the governing body is not the name of the museum. Um, so there might be a difference there, which is okay. Um, and then it runs through the uh, requirements for the constitution which we discussed earlier and then it asks you at the bottom to, as a tick box to say what sort of constitution your organisation has. So there's an opportunity to say within that. 
Uh, it asks you to attach your museum's current governing documents and to briefly describe how they meet the constitutional criteria, that list of items one to five. And you have 500 words uh, to explain that. It then asks you which regulatory framework your museum operates under, so how that also works, and for some information about your charity or your company number, if that's relevant. Moving on from that, it asks you to confirm whether the governing body operates the museum directly or whether it's a contracted or separately constituted management organisation. And the final question, question six, is about commitment and timescales for making a full application. So it's asking you to uh, explain and to commit to say that yes, you would like, you are likely to submit within the three year period. And that, that commitment has to be either through a letter from the trustees or it might be listed already in your forward or business plan. Um, so some kind of cross-referenced or attached document is required there. I think the thing to remember is that we're not trying to catch anybody out. We're trying to help museums to become accredited and we want you to be the best you can be. So um, I'm just going to provide a bit of information now about making your actual accreditation application. So this is a real overview. There is obviously a lot more detail involved in actually pulling all the policies, plans, procedures and documents required together. But this is an overview to enable you just to see how it will work in practice. So one of the things we talked about earlier on, and I think I've mentioned twice already, was about um, the accreditation standard applying proportionately to a museum's type and size. So within the accreditation guidance, there are these indicators that where you can select uh, what sort of museum you are based on a range of factors. And this ensures that your application is assessed proportionately. So here on the right hand side of the slide, you can see the scalability type that you might be. So there's three sections within the independent museums, local authorities, museums and university museums. And if you're a national or a nationally styled museum, then, there's, then you would need to tick that box too. I think the thing um, to look at when you look at those indicators is to understand that the museum might not tick every box for an indicator, say for a type one museum, but it might be that the majority of, of factors are met within that indicator. Okay, so getting started. Accreditation works best if your museum adopts a team approach to meeting the standard. So it's important to remember that accreditation is an ongoing process. It's not a one-off event. Once you've created your business or forward planning documents, your policies, plans and procedures, these are things that you'll want to keep updating and reviewing and ensuring that the museum is keeping up to date with. We always find that a good place to start is to review what you're currently doing against the museum accreditation standard. You will probably have much more in place than you realise and although things might have to be tweaked, you will probably have a range of policies and plans there already. Really important is to familiarise yourself with the accreditation guidance document. It does absolutely hold all the information that you'll need to make your accreditation application. And it lays out really clearly what is expected of the museum. From there, you can develop an action plan which can address the museum's areas of development and develop policies, plans and procedures that you may need. I think the importance of the team approach means that people can develop uh, the policies, plans and procedures in their area of expertise. And it's not just one person's responsibility to do accreditation. So we have, we have a much more holistic approach to, to accreditation reaching out across all areas of the museum. You'll find it incredibly useful to contact your museum development accreditation advisor. And talking to other accredited museums is also really helpful we're a really helpful sector and people will be happy to share their experiences with you.
access to professional advice. I mentioned earlier about um, some museums requiring a mentor. So all museums need some access to professional advice to meet the standard. And this can be met in a variety of ways. So if you've got paid staff, it could be that the professional advice is provided through that means. It could be that you have a member of the governing body who has a, is a museum professional, or it could be that if you don't have access to um, professional advice in that way, that you'll need an accreditation mentor. And accreditation mentors are generally there to support smaller museums, um, often the voluntary sector, and accreditation mentors themselves often provide this in their, their own voluntary capacity. There is information within the guidance document about what the requirements are to meet the needs for professional advice. Um, but just a little bit more about mentoring, because having a mentor during that period of a working towards status can be incredibly helpful for a lot of museums. The museum and the mentor sign an agreement which details the terms of the appointment and the expectations on both sides. And museum mentors support their museums through the accreditation application and returns process. On average, we think that mentors spend approximately four days a year. It can vary slightly depending on which stage a museum is at and how much support they actually need. But there is a formal agreement between a museum and the mentor and an annual review needs to take place with the museum, which will be linked to your forward planning, which enables the mentor to see where there might be areas of expertise that you need a bit of support with or extra advice. In general, mentors will help museums source advice. They will endorse the accreditation application and returns. They will visit twice a year. One visit must be a governing body meeting. And the other one is really helpful to, to see when, go and visit when the museum is open. So you can see how um, visitors are interacting with the museum. Um, mentors will confirm their support for the coming year at the annual review. So although there is a formalised process to it, we do find that mentors on the whole are really um, keen to be involved um, with museums and to help and support people. And it can be a relationship that lasts several years or can be something that's um, more short term. So how do you actually become accredited then? So you've got your eligibility, you've got your three years to um, get all of your policies, plans, procedures and information all lined up. You've um, got yourself an accreditation mentor if you need one. Um, what do you do when you've got all of that together and then you want to make your application? Well, all accredited museums apply using an online application form and they support the application form with their range of documents that they upload. So that could be policies, plans, other evidence that you've got of how you meet the standard. The online system is run through the Arts Council England and it is called Grantium and museums have to register on the site prior to um, then making their application. There is information about registering on the Arts Council England website. So once you have submitted all of your information, an initial assessment is undertaken by an assessor and this is based on the published accreditation standard and the associated guidance documents. So as I said before, there'll be no surprises. The assessors are assessing you against the published information. As you will be a new uh, museum to the standard, an assessor will visit the museum as part of the assessment. This is a really wonderful opportunity for you to show the assessor all of the really wonderful things that the museum does well and for the assessor to understand a little bit more about how the museum operates and the context behind it. Um, completed assessments are submitted to a, for a quality assurance review so they're moderated and then they're scheduled for consideration by the accreditation panel. This is formed of members of the wider accreditation committee and the accreditation committee is made up of people across the board of museums. So right across independence, national museums, local authority museums, it has representatives of all different types of museums. The panel then decides the award outcome 
and the award is confirmed as appropriate. So it's quite a well regulated and simple process once you've got your application in. So what's a museum accreditation return then? Once museums are accredited, they commit to continuing to meet the accreditation standard. So museums will be invited to complete an accreditation return every five years, which will confirm they continue to meet all areas of the standard. Any significant changes which might happen in the interim, which might affect the museum meeting the accreditation standard, have to be reported to the accreditation team at Arts Council England. Okay. And support for museum accreditation. I think I've mentioned a time or two already that Arts Council England publish an absolute range of information to help support you. And Collections Trust has lots of resources, information, links, examples of policies, plans and procedures, etc., all on their website under their accreditation heading. Museum development is really crucial to this whole process and your regional team is there to provide support and advice through the accreditation advisor, but also through all of the other programmes that they run that support museums to be better and to um, develop programmes that work for them. So that's the end of the session. Thank you very much for watching and I hope you found it useful. If you're a museum in the East Midlands, please do contact us at the East Midlands office or you can contact me on my email address, which is there at the bottom. Good luck with the accreditation scheme.